Lighthouse Church presents the following message by Pastor Jason Holloman. Uh, if you have a Bible, uh, turn with me to John chapter 16. If you have a Bible, turn with me to John chapter 16. So we are in our third week of our Advent season. We're in our third week. The first week we had uh, the, the, um, the verb, which is also a noun, love. We looked at love. We looked at hope, uh, and then today we're looking at joy. Uh, next week, we will look at peace. That'll be on the 18th. Uh, it also happens to be uh, the same day as our groundbreaking, which currently looks like it's going to be an unbelievable, uh, sloppy, wet, muddy mess. So details to, to follow on that, but just prepare your hearts, uh, church. Um, we might have to get very creative with our groundbreaking because it looks like it will be four-wheel drive only uh, to get to it. So, but more details on that as we go. Uh, but this week, this week we have joy. Uh, that is the word that we're looking at. And so you'll see that we have three of our candles lit behind me, uh, representing, jo- representing jo- uh, love, uh, hope, today joy, and then next week will be peace. And so as you look at this idea of joy, I've, I've been jotting notes down. I've been thinking about um, the, this series. I've been thinking about the Advent season for years. But this particular Advent season, I've just been thinking about it for such a long time, trying to cap, encapsulate this idea of what we want. And so much of what the Advent season represents is so much of what everybody wants. That's what makes this so tough. So if I say, hey, um, we're going to talk about love. Everybody's like, I want to love right? It's like, hey, we're going to talk about peace. I want some peace, right? Everybody wants the things that we talk about in the Advent season. Everybody wants it. Everybody wants joy. Even Giambattista said here in the announcement, I could use a little more joy. We could all use a little more joy. Like, I mean, that's, that's the whole idea. Nobody says, eh, I got enough of that. Like if I said, hey, I've got an entire pocket full of joy. Nobody would say, no, no, I'm good. I'm good. It's like, seriously, a pocket full of, it's right here. Do you want some of it? Everybody would say yes. If I said, hey, I got some love to give. I got a lot of love to give. Do you want some love? Everybody would be like, no, I'm pretty good. Thanks, no thanks, no need for love. Nobody would say that. And then as we look next week, nobody's going to say that about peace. Now, I jot some ideas down because I think we have to attack this idea culturally that joy is not happiness. Happiness is an altogether different thing. Now, I mentioned that I was going to make fun of sports. Enter sports being made fun of story. So I I don't remember the year. In fact, I asked Brandon about this. I don't remember the year. It was around 2010. If you're a big-time Stars fan, you'll know exactly the year I'm talking about. But there was a year with the Stars that that, uh, I was invited because I was a part of a larger group of guys in a Bible study where they were all Stars fans. And the guy in the, the, the Stars fan uh, Bible study, um, he worked for the stars. And so he was able to just get all of these tickets. And so they were doing really, really well. And so everybody was like, hey, what do y'all want to do this Friday night? And I'd say, I don't know, man, let's go, let's go hunt something. They're like, let's go to the stars game. And I would always be like, oh gosh, okay, great. And so we would go to the stars game. But here's what I learned about the stars game. If you are a rabid fan, sports fan, and, and your team is doing well, and you're in-house, that is your home, you're in the house, there is nothing more crazy than being around crazy fans, okay? There was one particular guy, I have to leave him nameless, but he was known, I guess, by the organization to be the guy that liked to play the air guitar every time they would score a goal. So remember, these big horns would go off, and all of a sudden, he would literally take off his shirt and just start playing the air guitar and it was insane. I could not get away from him fast enough. <laughs> like, my greatest fear was that the camera would pan to him, and it would be me there doing this. <laughs> right? Right? And so every time he would just throw off his shirt, of course, the, his entire body was painted stars colors. Um, he, he would throw off his shirt and start playing the air guitar, and literally, I would just try to get out of the way. I would just try to move to do whatever I could. And this particular game, they would score goals And every goal, they got crazier and crazier. And I watched grown men crying and holding up their hands in worship. I mean, it was the most wild moment. 
just to watch them lose that game at the end. Like, and it's like, and then you look over at the nameless stars idolater and you say, what, what do you do? Where's the net underneath your feet when the earth gives way? Where do you go, right? And then just to see him just devastated. I mean, I mean, like devastated in a way that like you can't get the body paint off fast enough, you know? And, and so I just, and I just remember watching this thinking, look at the heights of happiness, Look at the heights of enjoyment, and look at the heights of the highs, right? And then look at the lows of the lows, and it occurred to me in a couple of these different moments that joy can't leave you that fast, that happiness can come in and leave, and it could be wicked fast. You could, you could, you could have happiness enter into your experience and leave your experience in such a fast way that it feels displacing. So think of some of the happy things in your life, all the happiness in your life, right? Think of the things that you enjoy doing or whatever it might be. Like, you know what I'm talking about here. And so that's kind of what's in my mind when I'm thinking about cultural happiness. In fact, I wrote here, there's kind of like this idea with happiness. It's kind of an external fun where, where there's an idea when it comes to joy that it's kind of like an internal security, like an internal satisfaction, you get the idea that happiness feels emotional. There's like an emotion to happiness. And there's this idea that joy feels really spiritual. Now, before you say, well, yeah, but non-Christians are, non are um, uh, joyful. It's like, well, yes, I said spiritual. I didn't say Christian. Yeah, there's, this, there's a spiritualness to, to joy. There's this idea that happiness is temporary, whereas joy has greater lasting endurance to it. It's just different. It's just a different quality altogether. In fact, so I was starting to think like in my own life, I was like, okay, when was the last time that I just got a sense of joy? So I, I regularly will try to just, when I see something beautiful starting to emerge, occasionally those things quickly fall apart. If you have children, they can fall apart well as fast as a game could be lost, I can tell you that. Uh, but, but I often, when I see things kind of being built in a way where it looks like, oh, this looks like it's about to be a moment, and in my head and in my mind, I'm like, we're about to have a special moment. And I start to like get excited and I start to think, okay, I'm going to like try to record this as a dad or as a father or as a husband or as a friend or as a brother. And one of those moments happened recently when, when my wife um, came to our children and said, hey, we have our advent calendars uh, to this year. And all the kids are like, what? And, and so my wife does a great job trying to make advent calendars look very specific. And so as I'm like sitting there watching my wife kind of unveil these different advent calendars, not all of them as spiritual as you'd think. One of them was just a hot chocolate advent calendar, right? Super special, but to my son that really loves hot chocolate, it was the most meaningful thing ever, right? Then there was a Lego advent calendar, a little stuffed animal advent calendar, on and on and on. And as I watched my wife give these calendars out, I watched my children, I watched my wife, I watched this moment of reflecting upon the season of Advent in a specific way, in a meaningful moment. And I just stepped backwards and just pushed record in my eyes on the moment. Deeply, 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 spiritually meaningful. It was, it was, it was filled with joy. What, why? Well, because I know my kids. Why? Because I know the Savior we're celebrating. Why? Because the season's special. Why? See, there's a thousand whys underneath that. And there's a difference there. And, and, so, and that's just the most recent example of like a, like a moment of joy that I can remember. But yet, that doesn't, but joy isn't just moments. No, no. And that's the whole idea. I'm, 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 I'm bringing in the concept that happiness is not joy. And though happiness will come and go, joy is what we are to pursue. Everybody's pursuing happiness. But those who really know, know to pursue joy. Now, if you have your Bible, John chapter 16, 
Jesus here is trying to give us a, a, this distinction. He's trying to give us a distinction between the idea of happiness and the idea of joy. He's trying to bring this distinction for us, and it's a significant distinction. In fact, we're going to see the words of Jesus here. We're going to see the words of Paul uh, in 2 Corinthians here, trying to give us uh, the differences between the two. Now, this is such a beautiful passage, and I, I was going to start with verses, um, uh, with verses 17, but we'll go ahead and start with verses 16. John chapter 16, verses 16. A little while, you will again see me no longer. And again, in a little while, you will will see me. Verse 17. And some of the disciples said to one another, what is this he's saying to us? Don't you just love when the disciples are honest? I have no idea what you're saying, Jesus. You're obviously the best teacher that ever lived. We are completely confused by you. In a little while, and you will not see me. And again, in a little while, you will see me. And that is because I am going to the Father. Verse 18, so they were saying, what does it mean a little while? We do not know what he's talking about. Verse 19, Jesus knew what they wanted to ask him, and so he said to them. See, I wish I had this gift as a parent, right? Sometimes I feel like I have it in in, in just a bit, but where it's like, they have no idea what you're saying, but you know what it is that they need to hear, right? Jesus knew what they needed to ask him, and so he said to them, this is what you are asking yourselves what it meant by saying a little while. And you will not see me, and again in a little while you will see me. Verse 20, truly, truly I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but the sorrow will turn into joy. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she, is no, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. Verse 22, so you have sorrow now, but you will see again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. And that the day you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, I will give it to you. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive that your joy may be full. And so here he is talking very, very clearly through this illustration of a woman giving birth that happiness is quite different than joy. In fact, I would say, uh, having watched my wife now deliver four babies, there has been very little happiness involved in the process. I've just been a participant, so I don't have exact knowledge, but as a participant, notice my hands, see, no, no, no uh, I'm just, these are my easy hands here, right? But given the process, it's pretty clear that the results of joy, the, that the anticipation of joy has been unbelievable. Joy at its highest that we know how to give. Happiness, not so much, not so much. Paul, when he's bringing out this idea, if you have your Bibles, turn to 2 Corinthians 2 Corinthians, uh, beginning in verse 7, he says, excuse me, uh, 2 Corinthians 7, beginning in verse 4, he says this, I'm acting with great boldness towards you. I have great pride in you. I am filled with comfort, and in our affliction, I am overflowed with joy. What? In our affliction? What are we talking about? In our affliction? No, Paul here is separating this idea of happiness and joy. In fact, if you really want to see some of the complications we have in culture, is that we have an entire culture that is only willing to accept momentary happiness and unwilling to invest in what is necessary for joy. I think the microwave is most to be blamed here. I genuinely do. I'm telling you, I remember the days before a microwave. I remember when my dad would say, hey, guess what we're having tonight? I'm like, what are we having tonight? Chicken pot pies. And I'd literally think, this is amazing. I'm going to be eating in 55 minutes. <laughs> I cannot wait. I remember it. Like, I literally remember like it was yesterday. I would run to the freezer, and I'd scoop those aluminum things out of the deal, and I'd run in. My, they would be stuck to my hands, and I'd be like, look, Dad, and I'd just hold them over, and they'd just be hanging from my hands. And then I'd say, turn on the oven, you know, and it looked more like a nuclear reactor, right? And, man, we would take those things, and we'd throw them in the oven, And I just remember setting the timer to 55 minutes. And I just remember thinking, 
This is amazing. 55 minutes. Man, I could almost drive to my famous fast, like my favorite fast food restaurant in Fort Worth and back in that time now. Like, I mean, I'm telling you, like so much of what we have today is just fast and cheap and easy. And listen, I'm not even that old. I'm 46, and I remember that, right? Now, now, the second idea here, not just that joy is different than happiness, the second idea that I I want us to, to dial in here, and this is the idea that we'll conclude our time with, that our joy is directly linked to what is on the throne of our heart. Hmm, ooh. Do we want to talk about this? Do we want to talk about this? Now, how do we know what's on the, how do we know what the throne is? So you say, oh, the throne of our heart, that's odd. What are you saying, right? Like how the disciples were confused by the teaching of Jesus. You might be confused by the teaching that I'm trying to give you on the throne of your heart. Well, here's four ways to know what the throne is in your heart. You ready? Here's four ways to know what the throne is. First, what is the thing that you worship? What is it that you worship? What is the thing that you really want or long for? That kind of gives evidence of what's on the throne of your heart. Secondly, what is the thing that connects all the other things, right? Like if, if what's on the throne of your heart is that you're a Texan, right? Then everything kind of connects back to the idea that like you're a Texan, right? This idea like what is, what is the thing that connects all the other things? If you were to walk into a room, what is the thing that everybody would say, oh, that makes sense? That, that, that makes sense about that person. This thing helps connect all the other things in this person's life. Number three, what is it that you're willing to sacrifice for? Who? Man, gosh, it's getting hot in here. We need to turn the air on. Getting hot. So what is it that when you look at your life, or even better yet, your spouse, or your brother, or your sister, or your children would say, what is the thing that your children would say you're willing to sacrifice for. Listen, this is why during, uh, during the, the season of Lent uh, in January, I'll ask my children, hey, what are the things you think uh, has, that dad has loved more than he should in 2022? Those are the things that I'm gonna give up in 2023. You know what they've never said? Exercise. <laughs> you know, dad, I've been looking at your life for the last 10 years, and uh, man, exercise has just gripped your heart. And because of that, Dad, we really think as your children, you should just lay it down as an offering unto the Lord in January of 2023. That has never happened in my life. Laugh it up, guys. Laugh it up. But no, that's never happened. Like, they've never said to me, yeah, Dad, give it up. No, the things they've asked me to give up are particular conservative political news websites. (sighs) Right? They're watching our lives. Like, what is it then? If you think, I don't, ha- I don't know what I would sacrifice for, well, then ask somebody in your family. They'll know. Oh, they'll know. You might just not want to hear it. But yeah, yeah, so what is it that you're willing to sacrifice for? And then fourth, what are we doing? What is the fourth way to kind of identify what is the throne of our heart? The fourth is this. What is the net that kind of catches you when the earth gives way? What is that thing that is kind of always there? In fact, I was with a family a number of years ago now, and a lady came in. We were talking with her and her husband, and, and, I, and she just was absolutely distraught at the death of her dad, and that makes complete and total sense. Something about her grief felt different than what it should be the normative grief of the loss of a father. And upon talking and having some time with them and upon listening to her husband and, and listening to her children, it became very clear that her father was on the throne of her heart. That, and and how, how was he on the throne of her heart? He was on the throne of her heart that when things fell apart, he was the net that always caught her. And now that he was gone, she felt that there was no safety, there was no net underneath her, that, that though there were other things to catch her, this final net, this thing that she kind of rested on, was no longer present. And so she just felt for the first time without safety in her life which is very common in the death of fathers. And, and so we begin to see that like, this was an evidence of this particular woman's heart, that, that it was her father that was on the throne of her heart. Now, what is the point? Our joy is directly tied. Our joy is directly tied to that which is on the throne 
of our heart. Now, if you, if you look at your experience, if you look at the experience of your life, so much can come and go. So many things can be toppled. So many different areas of joys or whatever can go. But if the throne of our heart be Christ, if on the throne of our heart is God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, then in him there is freedom of joy. That there is nothing else that can topple. We see this in the Apostle Paul. When Paul's writing to the church in Philippi, literally he is in jail at this point. He's writing to the church, and as he writes the book of Philippians, he, as he's writing this to the, again, he's in jail. He's already written 2 Corinthians, where he's already been made fun of for his apostleship. He's already trying to defend himself, like, hey, look, I actually have seen God. Hey, I've actually seen visions. I mean, he has had such endurance, uh, or so many uh, difficult circumstances happening to him, and now he finds himself in jail, and now he's writing this letter, and what does he say? In fact, I'll read it in, in, um, in Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1, beginning, excuse me, chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and, and long for, my joy and my crown stand firm in the Lord. Here's a guy who has nothing at this point. He had so much to to, to joy, to, to, to boast in, has nothing at this point, finds himself in the midst of jail. And what does he say? Oh, my joy is completely and totally secure. Why is that? Because what was on the throne of his heart was not freedom. It was Christ. What was on the throne? What is the crown on his head? It was Christ, not his freedom. Now, in fact, he continues. If you go with chapter 4, beginning in verse 4, he then makes this declaration. And by the way, it makes a lot more sense when somebody says this from jail, I don't know if that helps you, but it helps me. So if somebody says, hey, you really should care about this. I mean, this is a really big deal. And you, sometimes I just want to say, seriously? Like, like, what are you talking about this is a big deal? Like, it's so easy for you. Like, so often I, I want to say back to somebody who tells me that I should do something. They start to put should on me, right? Hey, you should really do this thing. And I was like, man, it's easy for you. That's my first thought. My, my heart's first thought is to say that. Paul is saying that we, in verse 4, are to rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Philippians 4, 4. He's in jail. Doesn't that help the context a little bit? He's not sitting at Caesarea Philippi, you know, looking out over the sea, eating olives, you know, from a private grove. Like, he's not doing that. He's not sitting there enjoying, like, a, a fat life, an easy life. Oh, he's in the midst of jail, being maltreated and abused and he says to these to this church in philippi no 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 no. yeah yeah, i'm in jail but i'm telling you all the more rejoice always and again i will say rejoice so what do we do with that what do we do with that this season is a fun season and we can look at Luke 2, we can look at Matthew 2. In fact, uh, on Christmas, or excuse me, on uh, New, Year, uh, New Year's Eve, on Christmas Eve, New Year's, Christmas Day, those are different times. I'm talking about Christmas Eve. On Christmas Eve, the 24th, uh, we're going to look at the narrative of Jesus being sent into the world. In fact, I, I, I was had the privilege of finishing the sermon for Christmas Eve this morning, and in Matthew chapter 2, you see the wise men before Herod. So they're before the king, right? They're sitting there before the king, and as they're in the king's palace, and, and before, like, how many people want to be before the king? Lots of people do. Lots of people want to be in the king's court. And these wise men are in the midst of the king's court. And while they're there, the Bible records in verse 10 and 11 of Matthew chapter 2, that though they're before an earthly king, their hearts we're pondering what the star meant for a heavenly king. And the Bible says that when they saw the star, they were exceedingly joyful. Exceedingly joyful. They just got out of spending time with the king, an earthly king. But their hearts were captivated by a heavenly king. In fact, that's literally the title of our Christmas Eve sermon. And, and so today... The subject is joy. And my question for you is, 
if you do not have joy, then you don't have to. This is a really good thing. It's great for you to know if you don't have joy. Amazing. I'm so glad that you've able to be able to discern that in your heart. It's because something else is on the throne of your heart. That's why. And you might say, oh, man, I'm a Christian. Believe you. I totally believe you. Just because you're a Christian doesn't mean you're perfect. Just means you're practicing. You got to hear me. Seriously. Lawyers, they practice law. Doctors, they practice medicine. Christians, practice walking out like Christ. This is really important. So what if you're a Christian? You can absolutely have something ruling and reigning the affections of your heart and have eternal, secure salvation. And how do I know? Because so many of us walk around like we're dead without any joy. So if you're walking around like a dead man or a dead woman, walking around just thinking about all the things that are not being fulfilled or cared for. Listen, there's so many believers that I just want to walk up to and, and not physically shake because that's assault and can land me in jail. But I want to spiritually, in the third heaven, shake these people. Right? Wake up! Find your joy, it's in Jesus! Get a hold of yourself. I'm kidding, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that. <laughs> What I love about that is, is, is half of the, the women over 50 in the room just went, <laughs> like, no, your pastor is not violent. I would not do that. In particular, Renee, I would not do that. <laughs> yes, uh, that was so fun. I probably should not do that again. I'll go ahead and put that in the notes. Don't simulate hitting from pulpit again. Check. Got it. No, I just want to shake folks and just say, guys, guys, if what you're looking for is joy, then beg God through the power of his spirit that the son would be on the throne of your heart. Let him be the net. Let him be that which you sacrifice for. Let him be that which you're willing to desire and pursue. And if you look at that and say, I have no idea how to do that, praise God, then there's a group of people here at the church that would love to disciple you towards that. And I mean that sincerely. Sincerely. There's a ton of folks that would love to disciple you there. Because the Bible says this in Luke 15. In Luke 15, 10, the Bible says that there is no greater celebration of joy of the angels in heaven than when a sinner repents. So friends, if we're looking for joy, if we want this joy to not just be earthly joy in the hearts of believers, then let us make it heavenly joy with the angelic hosts who are shouting for joy when a single sinner repents repents. Yeah, but I'm a Christian. I know. And you're a sinner. And so, man, if you, if you have lost your joy, fine. Repent. Turn from that which has been put on the throne. Beg that Jesus would do a work in your heart. Turn from that sin and let us see the angels in heaven rejoice. Now, as the band would come up as we enter our time of the Lord's Supper, the prophet Jeremiah, in uh, Jeremiah chapter 15, beginning in verse 16, if you're familiar with the prophet of Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah, it's such a hard book. In fact, in particular, in, in 215, it's even harder. And uh, the prophet Jeremiah is the weeping prophet. Why? Because there's nothing to rejoice over. He's just weeping all the time. And, uh, and in uh, Jeremiah 15, beginning in verse 16, he says this, I ate these words of yours. And they produced in me comfort and joy. And so here's, that's been my prayer for you today. That I would push and say, hey, some of you are not walking in the fullness of joy. And that I would push and say, it's because you're putting something else on the throne of your heart. So I'm pushing this way, that the scriptures would push into your experience this way. And then I'm hopeful that you would consume that concept that you'd consume the words of scripture as the prophet Jeremiah did and that the, the produce of that would be comfort and joy. Uh, Spurgeon preaches a message in the 1800s on, um, on the duty of joy, preached in 1880 something uh, and it was based upon, it was a fantastic, I read the transcript, a fantastic uh, sermon uh, that he preached uh, based upon the passage of Philippians 4.4. And in it, he talks about the idea of medicine 
not tasting good. Remember again, this is the late 1800s, right? And so Spurgeon is talking about how sometimes you can take medicine, but it's bitter and it, it burns and it's not any good and it doesn't taste good, but the effects of the medicine are good. And I started to think about that in my current situation. When I go to CVS to get medicine for my children, they say, grape or bubble gum? It's like, seriously? They're like, yeah, do you want, you want it to taste like grape or bubble gum? And I'm like, this is an amazing world we live in, right? <laughs> I mean, like, come on, give me a break. But not only is it sweet to the taste, but comfort in its effect. And so my prayer today has, has been truly for you that this word would be sweet to the ears, but it wouldn't just remain there, but that it would be comfort to a weary soul. That it would, not, it would be like medicine that is good for the taste, but that would merit in your hearts comfort and joy because that is what God gives in himself. It's unbelievable. And if you don't believe me, then test the theory. The most patient, kind, gentle, loving, wonderful people in the hardest moments of medical uncertainty today are believers who love Jesus Christ in hospital rooms today. I know I'm in the hospitals a lot. And you can immediately tell the difference between a believer and a person who is not a believer. You just can. In fact, I, I, have, I have literally heard um, the testimonies of nurses who say, this gentleman here or this woman here, they are unbelievably inappropriate in their level of joy given their medical circumstance. See it? That could be ours in Christ. That could be yours in Christ. On the night that Jesus was to be betrayed, he takes the elements. And this would have been one of those moments where the disciples would not have known what to do with it, right? So the disciples would have been like, this is a little different. This Seder would have been a little bit different. And he takes the bread and he breaks the bread. And he looks at his disciples and he says, take and eat my body broken for you church let us remember the broken body of christ and in like manner jesus would have taken the cup and he would have uh, talked up in a normal Seder fashion, and for those of you that were in our last year's Seder, you remember what the cup represented. Jesus reinstitutes this cup, and he says, this is the cup of the new covenant. Take and drink. Church, let us remember the new covenant. Father, we do receive from you in this in this act that we are to wait and remember you by. You didn't return for your church this week. We've been praying that you would. You didn't. You didn't return. And so would you help us to be faithful as we allow this day, this Lord's day, to begin another week. This is the beginning of the week. And yet we celebrate this beginning of week with the broken body and shed blood. And so we ask that you would return for your church this week. If you tarry, would you help us to be faithful this week? Would you help us to consider what's on the throne of our hearts as we consider the joys or lack of joys in our hearts? Holy Spirit, come, we pray. Fill your church with glory. Fill your church with peace. Fill Lighthouse Church with joy, we pray. Holy Spirit, come, we ask. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We hope you've enjoyed today's message. For more information, visit our website at lighthousentx.com.